So at the end of every year, toward the end of every year, I take two days. I go to this little cabin that's just north of, north of here that uh, some people from Relevant owns. I take two days, and I just get along with God, and I seriously sit for two days trying to hear from him, from me asking the question, God, what do you have for our church over this next year? Like, where, is there anything you want to lead us into, anything you have for us? And uh, I'll be honest with you, there are, are years where I do those two days where it is extraordinarily frustrating. I get to the end of those two days, feel like I haven't heard anything, and I just walk away like, what the heck did I just waste my time doing? And then there's times when, man, my brain's just flooding with stuff, and I feel like God's putting a lot of things in my mind. Well, I did this once again at the end of 2021. God, what would you have for us in 2022? And about a Day in, uh, this phrase just came to my mind, like out of nowhere, the phrase extreme ownership, that our church needs to take extreme ownership. And I didn't even, I was like, what does that even mean? But quickly I thought like, hey, I I think there's actually a book called Extreme Ownership. And I Googled it, sure enough, there's a book. And so I called my assistant, Cindy Rainey, and I was like, hey, can you order me this book called Extreme Ownership? She goes, Ronnie, I ordered that for you months ago. And uh, so, I, and I had it sitting on my shelf. I've, I've never even read it. And as soon as she said that, I was like, I knew. I knew that was supposed to be what our, our theme going into this year. But I just didn't know what it meant. Um, and, and so as I prayed more, I just really felt like, man, we, we, had to, we had to create a culture of extreme ownership. So I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. But why do, why do we need to create a culture of extreme ownership in our church? And I think the, the answer is because of what the church is. And the Apostle Paul described what the church is in the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians, which 1 first, first Corinthians is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul 30 or so years after the events of Jesus' life in the first century to the community of Christ followers in the city of Corinth. And, and he wrote this to them. He said, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, referring to God's spirit or the Holy Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now you, he's speaking to the entire community of followers of Christ in Corinth, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is individual followers of Christ is a part of it. Uh, Another English translation says, are members of it. So as we talked about last week, Paul is using an analogy to make a point. He's saying, you know how your physical body works, right? You know how you have a lot of different body parts. You got a head and shoulder and elbow and arms and torso and legs and knees and feet, you know, but each of these body parts has a different function, but they all make up your one body. He's saying, well, once you put your faith in Jesus, the same thing applies to you. The writers of the New Testament are clear that at the moment we put our faith in Jesus, by asking him to be the forgiver of our sins and the leader of our life, God's spirit or the Holy Spirit takes residence within us. And at that moment, we become part of this amazing thing that Jesus established called the church, which means the church is not a building. The church is not a Sunday morning program. The church is a people. The church is every other follower of Christ, every other person who's put their faith in Jesus all throughout the entire world. Paul refers to the church as the body of Christ because Jesus established his church to be his hands and feet to carry on the mission that he came for. Jesus established his church to usher in his love and joy and hope and peace and salvation and forgiveness, redemption, healing, provision, justice, mercy, grace, his kingdom together in such a way that people and families and schools and communities and lives and eternities and the world is transformed. Jesus came, he died, he rose to be the hope of the world, to be your hope, to be my hope. And before he physically left, he established his church to be the physical embodiment of him as his agents of hope in the world until he physically returns. As followers of Christ, as people who have put our faith in Jesus, we together are the body of Christ here and now. When you put your faith in Jesus, you become a member of, of the body of Christ. Now, it's absolutely impossible to practically live out being the body of Christ with every other Christ follower in the world, and that's why there's local churches, so, you know, smaller communities of Christ followers who live as the body of Christ in a local context. As followers of Christ, we are called to live as members of his body through the context of a local church. He's, Jesus has called us to be part of a we that function as the body of Christ, that carry on his mission together, that embodies 
his presence together. And you see over and over and over throughout scripture and throughout history that when a local church is living as the body of Christ, they experience divine unity despite disagreement. They, they, the, the love of Jesus is seen and felt. People are putting their faith in him. Lives are being transformed. Cities are being changed. Authentic community is being experienced. Things that can only be attributed to God is happening. The fullness of God's presence is, is uh, uh, the fullness of God's presence and power is felt and experienced. God is moving. But so often that's not our church experience, is it? So often our church experience is opposite of that. Why? Well, there's a number of factors, but the one thing, if you look at most dying churches, churches that are like seemingly void of God's presence, kind of going in a downward trajectory, looks like, man, they're ready to just die altogether completely. The the one thing that all those churches have in common is that they're living half paralyzed, Like half of the body seems to be functioning and fully functioning and healthy and the other half is seemingly paralyzed and dead. And just with like our physical bodies, when that happens, the whole body begins to die. The whole body begins to deteriorate. Relevant community church, like every other local church, is the body of Christ We were Jesus' idea, which means he has a plan for us in regards to his kingdom and his glory. For those of you who say that this is your church, you are a member of this local body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, Jesus has given us a huge mission. He he has some God-sized visions for us. He wants to do a transforming work both in us and through us. He wants us to experience the fullness of his presence and his power. He wants to move The question that we must honestly answer if we hope to see and experience all that God has for us going forward is are we living as a half paralyzed or fully functioning body of Christ? Relevant? Are we living as a half paralyzed or fully functioning body of Christ? Man, we have an amazing church but like most churches we have some work to do here. So I sat there at that cabin praying, God, you know, what do you have for us this year? And he puts this phrase, extreme ownership, on my mind. And at that moment, God also impressed on me, in order to become the church that I created you relevant to be, in order to see everything I have for you as a church to come to fruition, in order to experience a transforming work I want to do in you and through you to the fullest as a church, will require everybody taking extreme ownership. Extreme ownership means taking full responsibility for everything that impacts us living Uh, living as a fully functioning body of Christ. Everything that impacts our health, and Jesus' mission through us, the visions God's laid on our hearts, our unity, our effectiveness, God being glorified through us, people being reached for Jesus, uh, lives being transformed, people being transformed to everything God's created us to be. After years of following Jesus, being a pastor, being a student of his church, what I've become convinced of is this. It takes extreme ownership from everybody to live as the body of Christ. It takes extreme ownership from everybody to live as the body of Christ. So relevant, what we're doing throughout this series is I'm challenging all of us. I'm challenging all of us to take extreme ownership in five specific ways. For everyone who says that you're you're a part of Relevant Community Church, I hope, I pray you accept these challenges because I believe if we all did, if we all did, 100% of us took extreme ownership in these ways, we'd see God work powerfully in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. We'd see the visions as God's laid on our hearts become a reality. We see God transform our lives, our friends, our families, our neighbors, our communities in, in community in ways we can't even be able to comprehend. We'd experience the fullness of God's presence and power like never before and that That's the type of church we'd all love to be a part of. Now it's interesting. It's interesting how most people, many people, typically approach church. I mean, what do most people, forget that, what do you look for and want out of church? Now, if I was to have everyone stand up and answer that question, or those of you watching online, I'd have you, you know, put it in the comments. You'd probably hear a lot of the same things. You probably want powerful preaching. You want preaching that convicts, yet inspires. We want you to be funny, not too long, good amount of time. You know, like, we want powerful preaching. We want awesome music. I mean, when we are, you know, we're worshiping, we feel God's presence. You know, just like God's moving in this place and the music is amazing. We want dynamic programs for our kids. 
Man, we want some amazing prayer where they want to go. They want to experience it. Their lives are being transformed. We want, man, we want to have amazing small groups. Small groups where we experience authentic community and love is felt and care is experienced. We want to have great resources and great tools to help, me, to help me grow in my relationship with Jesus, to help my marriage grow, to help with my mental health. And for those of you that went deeper, you'd say, we want to feel God's presence. We want to see God moving. We want to see people putting their faith in Jesus. We want to see lives transformed. I want to be part of a church it's making a difference. I mean, those are the type of things we'd all say if we said, what do you look for? What do you want most out of church? So that's not very interesting because it's this common answers. What's interesting is the most common problem I hear that people have with church, which is the church just wants my money. I mean, think about this. Think about it. Maybe you've said it in your own mind. What I want is a church that'll give, give, give me what I want, what I need, what I desire to see, but it, what I desire to see, but it seems like all the church wants is to take, 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 take from me. And I'm tired of pastors asking for money. I'm sick of every time I show up, they're talking about giving. And that's created a lot of tension in many people. It's caused some of you to walk away from church. It's caused others of you to say and maybe not think because you don't want to say it out loud, if and when you give me what I want and I need, then maybe I'll give. If and when I see and experience the thing, things that can only be attributed to God, then maybe I'll be inspired and moved enough to give or give more. If and when I see, feel God moving, then I'll be moved to give. If you keep asking me to give without giving me what I want, need, and desire first, we're going to have a problem. Okay, let me ask you a question. Which of these do you think comes first? The chicken or the egg? The cart or the horse? Powerful sermons or extravagant generosity? A great facility or sacrificial giving? Awesome environments for kids and students or generous giving? God working powerfully or us giving generously? Here's the reality. The tension that we all feel is a classic cart before the horse thing. Here's what we're going to discover today. I'm just going to let the cat right out of the bag to, to begin with. God works and moves through our generosity. Everything Jesus wants to do in and through his body is a byproduct of the members of his body giving generously. Seeing God work powerfully, seeing God transform people's lives, experiencing the fullness of God's presence and power, experiencing the, you know, all the things we desire from church is a byproduct of generosity. It doesn't magically come before. It's produced through generosity. Now, obviously, today I'm talking about money. Obviously, today I'm talking about giving. And that's going to make some of you uncomfortable. That's going to cause some tension in some of you. You know, last week, started the series, and you might have been inspired, like, even if you're convicted, like, oh, I'm going to go back next week or tune in next week. And, you know, like, woo, woo, woo. Now I'm talking about this. And you're like, next week we're going to have the lowest attendance of the year. <laughs> and some of you might not even want to come back next week. Because it doesn't matter what I say from this point forward, all you are going to do is chalk it up to the church just wants my money. So let me just be really honest with you right up front. I don't want your money, but I do want you to give generously. Because how God works and moves is through your and my generosity, and I want to see God work and move powerfully, and so do you. Now, Today, we're not going to talk about giving through a me filter. We talk about, you know, we try to inspire and talk about giving through a me filter all the time. When you give, when you're generous, here's what God does in your life. Here's what God does for you. We talk about that all the time. Today, I'm not doing that. Today, we're talking, we're not, we're talking about this through a we filter. Because today is for us. And so everything, I'm not going to even allude to us as an individual. I'm alluding to us as the body of Christ. And it's going to be very hard for you to hear this. And very hard for you to process in this way because we're so individualistic. Even you look back to last week. Last week, I, I said this phrase. Is it possible that Jesus leaves his body when his body isn't living as his body? And I had people coming up to me after the gathering was over and going, does that mean I can lose my salvation? I'm like, I never talked about you as an individual. Not one time. I talked about us as the body of Christ. Listen, we are the body of Christ. You are not the body of Christ. You are not the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. You are a member 
of the body of Christ. You're an elbow or a foot or a knee or a leg. So we're going to look at this through a we filter. If you're a follower of Christ, you are a member of the body of Christ, which means if you say you're a part of relevant community church, you need, we got to have you listen. i got to have you apply because what Jesus wants to do in and through our body is directly tied to what the members of this body, you and me, choose to do with this. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you never put your faith in Jesus, you say, I'm not a member of the body of Christ because I've never put my faith in Jesus, you don't have to listen to any of this. You don't have to apply any of this. Like you are totally off the hook and you can make the fun of the rest of us and all, do all that what you want to do but let me tell you what you can give even if you don't believe all this stuff and you can be generous even if you don't believe this stuff and listen I would encourage you to do it because you're here because you want something great you're here because you want to feel and you want to experience something great well that comes through people's generosity I just don't know what else to say so you can tune you can tune in to what we're talking about as well now we're going to go to two passages of scripture today one old testament passage one new testament passage and listen so often when we read scripture we try to read it through a me filter like it's written to me this is not a written to me thing this is written to a we thing so I want you to try to filter this and try to read this through a we filter not just through a me filter the first passage of scripture we're going to go to is in the Old Testament. It's the last book of the Old Testament. It's the book of Malachi. We're going to go to chapter 3. But before we go there, you've got to kind of understand, as part of God's redemptive plan for humanity, uh, he chose to bless the world through the Hebrew people who became known as the Israelites, who eventually became known as the Jews. 2,000 years before Jesus ever walked the face of the earth, God promised the Hebrew people that they would be his people and he would be their God. In order to live as his chosen people, God gave them some 600 plus laws and commands for how to live. This is known as the Mosaic Law. If you were to narrow down what God was trying to communicate through all these laws and commands, it was this, trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust me and obey me. And this came with the promise. If you trust and obey, I will bless you. I will bless you in such a way that you will know that I'm the one true God, that you'll experience the fullness of my presence and power, that the, a watching world will know that you are the people of the one true God. But it also came with the consequence. If you don't trust and obey, I will discipline you for, severely. So for 2,000 years, the Israelites, they went back and forth. They would trust and obey. God would bless them immensely. And then they would be disobedient and they'd experience devastating consequences. Finally, in 400 B.C., 400 years before Jesus ever walked the face of the earth, God was fed up with his people. So he sent the prophet Malachi to communicate a message to the Israelites. The book of Malachi is the recorded document of that message. And here's one of the things God spoke through Malachi to his people. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. He's going, hey, my love for you is unchanging regardless if you trust to obey me or not. That's the only reason I haven't wiped you off the face of the earth by now. But let's be clear. I should have. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and laws and commands and have not kept them. He's saying, you're my chosen people. You're my chosen nation. You've declared your love for me and your commitment to trust and obey me, but you've, you have not done that. And that's why you're not experiencing the fullness of my blessing, the fullness of my presence and my power so he says, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. And it's like he's pleading with them because he loves them so much, because he wants so much for them. Now let me ask you this question again. Which one comes first? Them returning or God working? God said, return to me, then I will return to you. But you ask, how are we to return? And it's like they're playing dumb. Like, we don't know what you want us to do to return. We're right here. We've been here the whole time, God. And God knows what they're doing. He knows they're playing dumb. So he gets real straightforward with them. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. By the way, you ever had anything stolen before? If you ever have, it's the worst feeling ever. Right? You feel, you know, violated and devalued. Well, this is what's happening in Malachi. God's own people had turned from the God that they say they love, they trust, and they obeyed by robbing him. But you ask, God, how are we robbing you? Like, hey, we didn't walk into the temple and steal anything, so God, how? Here's how, God says. In tithes and offerings, 
Now, in the Mosaic law, God commanded the Israelites to tithe. Tithe means tenth. God commanded the Israelites to give 10% of everything they had, they had and they earned to the priests to fund and support the ministry of the Jewish temple. In addition to this, they're required to give additional offerings at certain times and in certain situations. God said, trust and obey. Your obedience to this is evidence of your trust and your commitment to me and my kingdom and my temple and my will and my glory and my presence and my power. Your obedience to this is one of the things that separate you as my chosen people. Now, over time, unfortunately, and by the time we get to this time, the Israelites did, not, did, you know, did what we often do. Some were giving sacrificially. Many were giving God their leftovers. Others were giving nothing at all. Very few of them were trusting God enough to be fully obedient, and everyone had excuses why. And God said, how are you robbing me? You're robbing me by not trusting me enough to obey me in this way. You're robbing me of what I want to do in and through you as my people. Therefore, you are under a curse. It means no longer divinely blessed by God. The whole nation, if you were to equate this today, you'd say the whole entire body because you, the body, are robbing me of what I want to do in and through the body. God's saying, listen, I don't want that for my people. So here's what I want all my people to do. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. As, as if God is going, could I provide all the food needed for the ministry of the temple without you Israelites? Yeah, I could. But I've chosen to do it through you. Experiencing my divine blessing, experiencing the fullness of my presence and power, seeing me move and work is a byproduct of you giving. It comes in response to trusting and obeying me in this way, not be for it. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so many blessings, there will not be enough, enough, uh, room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. It's like he's going, I will do what only I can do when you trust and obey me by doing what only you can do as my people and my nation, by giving generously like I've commanded you to. So return to me. And unfortunately, the Israelites did not return to him in this way. And this is one of the reasons that God went silent for the next 400 years. For the next 400 years, they did not experience God's presence and power. It was silent. They wanted, they desired, they longed for God to do what only he can do in and through them, but they were unwilling to be obedient and do what only they could do first. Second passage I want to go to is, is the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. This is actually the second letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to the local church in the city of Corinth. And in chapter 9, he wrote this. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now real quick, once again, let's not read this through a me filter. Let's read this through a we filter. He wrote this to a church body. So let's read it through a we filter. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in the world of farming, you got to ask yourself, what comes first? In the world of farming, what comes first? The reaping or the sowing? We all know reaping comes through and after sowing. Paul's saying the same is true for us. We, we reap what we sow. Well, Paul, we go, we want to reap generously from God. So, Paul, how do we sow generously? And he goes, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. As members of the body of Christ, how do we, how do we sow generously so we generously reap what only God can do in and through our body? It's by everybody giving willfully, cheerfully, obediently, and generously first. And here's the promise. And God is able to bless you. You, the body of Christ, abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will, you will abound in every good work as the body of Christ. Let me ask you again, which comes first? God moving and working 
or us giving. Paul's saying God works and move, moves in the body of Christ through the members of his body giving first. In both the Old Testament and New Testament, we see over and over and over again that God works and moves through our generosity. God working and moving does not happen by chance. We reap what we sow. It's a byproduct of generosity. God working and moving is a result of our willingness to follow Jesus and be generous. God doesn't work and move to try to inspire us to be generous. God working and moving does not precede our willingness to give. It's a result of it. According to the writers of scripture, God's job, God's job is to work and move in ways that only he can. Our job is to give generously. Those two things are not isolated, they're very connected, and the latter comes before the former. When we do what only we can do, God has promised that he will do what only he can do. When we don't, God's promised nothing. We don't coerce God through our giving. We don't manipulate God through our giving. We trust and obey him through it. And when we choose to trust and obey God, God works and God moves. This is why you hear this phrase we say all the time at Relevant. God generates transformation through our generosity. That's what this means. God generates transformation through our generosity. So let's review. The church is the body of Christ. Every follower of Christ, every person who's put their faith in Jesus by asking him to be the forgiver of their sins and leader of their life, is a member of the body. Some are shoulders, some are elbows, some are arms, some are knees, some are legs, some are feet. The body needs everybody to be a fully functioning body. Relevant Community Church is the body of Christ. And our body, Relevant Community Church, needs everybody to take extreme ownership of the financial health of our body in order for us to live as the body of Christ. We take extreme ownership of the financial health of our body by giving generously. We live as fully functioning members of the body of Christ by giving generously. Everything Jesus wants to do in and through this body uh, is a byproduct of everybody giving generously. Seeing God work powerfully in our body. Seeing our, the visions God's put on our heart become a reality. Seeing God transform our lives and our friends and our neighbors and our city. Experiencing the fullness of God's presence and power. Experiencing all the things that we desire and we want from church is a byproduct of everybody's generosity. All the things that only God can do come through us doing what only we can do first. Our body needs everybody to take extreme ownership of the financial health of our body by giving generously. And relevant, the reality is, is we have some work to do here. Only 50% of our church gives anything at all. Believe it or not, it's kind of sad, that is way above average. Because in most churches, the average number of percentage of people that give in most churches is 15%. So like, we're evidently like overachievers. But this is still what it looks like with only 50% of us doing it. Don't fall over, Manny. It's like trying to operate as a fully functioning body without our frickin' arms. And yet, look at all that God's done without our arms. Imagine 100%. <laughs> Imagine if we had our arms. It would change everything. This empty jar right here, this represents all that God can and wants to do in our church. The fullness of his power and presence being felt. God moving powerfully. The, 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 the transformation he wants to produce in us individually and as a church body. The people he wants to reach. The eternities he wants changed. How he wants to use us to change our community. That represents, and it represents everything also that we want. Powerful sermons. Amazing music. Dynamic 
programs for kids and students. It represents all that God can and want to do and all the things we want. This pitcher full of water represents our capacity to fund that. Now here's the deal. God would not put any visions on our heart, call us to anything, want to do anything in us. Whatever he's put on our hearts, whatever he wants to do, I guarantee he's given our church body the capacity to fund it because God works and moves through our generosity. Now here's the reality, I just told you. Most churches, 15% of people give. 15%, which means they're leaving 85% left um, and they're not seeing 85% of what God can and want to do and what they want. We're overachievers, so we got 50%. And man, that's awesome. Look at all that God's done. He's done a lot of amazing things. And look at all he could do that we're not seeing that we're not experiencing. Old people, young people, middle school, high school, college students, wealthy people, poor people, married people, single people, divorced people, we, the rest of our church body, need you to take extreme ownership. We need you to because God works and moves through our generosity. Now listen, regardless of how maybe some of you inspired are, convicted are, regardless of how much you love Jesus or how much you love our church, there's a lot of things that can prevent us from giving generously. You know, just go down the list. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Young people will say, I just don't have very much and don't hardly make any money. You know, not having a plan can prevent us from giving. Greed can, fear can, money being our God can, living beyond our means can. There's all kinds of things that can prevent us from giving generously. But I want to shine the spotlight on one big thing that prevent us from living as members of the body of Christ by giving generously today. And it's something I alluded to last week. And it is being a consumer. Now, most people would not admit that they're consumers even if they think they might be. It's very hard to see in the mirror. You probably would never say it out loud. But here's how you know you're a consumer. I just want you to know some before you walk out. If you're constantly talking about all the things you want the church to give, 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 give you, powerful preaching, amazing music, dynamic programs for my kids, but you're also complaining how, how the church just wants your money and so therefore you don't give, you're a consumer. You're a consumer because you're treating the church like a commodity and a product to be consumed. And I want to remind you of something I said last week. The church it's not about you. The church does not revolve around your wants, your preferences, your needs, or your desires. The church is about Jesus, his glory, and his kingdom, and it centers around him and his mission. The church is not a product to be consumed. It's a people who live as the body of Christ. The church does not exist for us. We are the church. We exist for the world. We exist to be Jesus' hands and feet in the world. We are, exist to be the embodiment of Jesus here and now. As followers of Christ, we're not made to be consumers. We're called to be contributors because we are members of the body of Christ. So for your sake and our sake, I pray and I hope that you choose to no longer be a consumer, but if you choose to be one, at least be a good one. I mean, if you're going to choose to be a consumer, at least be a good consumer. Like, because in anything that you go buy as a product, you go pay money to have that product given to you. So be a good one. Ain't none of this crap for free. By the way, that's not the definition of consumer. That's the definition of a leech. If you want everything for free. Like, hey, you think those seats you're sitting on are free? You think these cameras that you watch online are free? You think good preaching comes for free? I could go make a lot of money somewhere else. Ain't none of, kids' programs don't come for free. So everything you're experiencing, if you're going to be a consumer, be a good one. Because none of this stuff is for free. Everything that you're enjoying, it's because someone paid for it. So for your sake and our sake, I pray and hope, choose that you no longer be a consumer because it's going to make church suck for you. It's going to make church suck for the rest of us. I pray and I hope you choose to take extreme ownership of being a fully functioning member of the body of Christ by giving generously because that's what's transformational for you. That's what's transformational for us. And that's what's transformational for a watching world. 
God works and moves through our generosity. So relevant. Let's take extreme ownership of the financial health of our body. Take extreme ownership and choose to be a contributor instead of a consumer. Choose. you got to choose to live as a functioning body part. And it starts with just saying, I'm going to do this. I am not going to be a consumer. I'm going to be a contributor. And once you make that decision, take extreme ownership and ask God what he would have you do in regard to your generosity. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He said, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Well, how do we decide what to give? We don't. We are followers of Christ. We ask him what he would have us do and whatever he would lead us into, we have to decide in our heart to trust and obey. You don't need to ask me what to give. I'm not your God. You don't answer to me. But you do answer to your heavenly father. So I'd encourage you to ask him, God, what would you have me do in regard to my financial generosity. God, what would you have me do? And by the way, just because you give 50 bucks a month doesn't mean you've ever asked this question. Just giving doesn't mean you've ever asked this question. Ask him, what would you have me do? If you ask, he's probably gonna lead you to something sacrificial that will require you to trust him. And that leads to the third way we take extreme ownership, which is to trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Follow Jesus by trusting and obeying because God works through our generosity. And I said this last week, but I got to say it again. Middle school students, high school students, college students, this is as much for you as it is for the rest of us. You don't do this later. You do this now. You're not a part of, you're not a member of the body of Christ later. You're a member of the body of Christ now. This is for you right now. It does not matter about quantity. It matters about trusting and obeying. Not just for you, for us. Because as a member of the body of Christ, we need you too. You know what would happen if we all took extreme ownership in this way? Man, we'd see an overflow. We'd reach so many kids and students, we'd see revival in our community. <laughs> we, we'd, have to, we'd have so many baptisms to do that we couldn't even do them all. We need a building that was 10 times bigger than the building that we have. We'd help bring hope and healing and transformation to the Korean people, both in Omaha and on the Thai Burma border, in unprecedented ways. We'd see numerous churches start out of us. We'd see God work powerfully in way work powerfully in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. We'd see the visions that God laid in our hearts become a reality. We'd see God transform our lives in ways we can't be able to comprehend. We'd experience the fullness of God's presence and power like never before. We'd experience an overflow of what only God can do. And let's be honest, that's what we all want. Do we want it enough to do what only we can do first? Because you reap what you sow. So let me ask you, are you taking extreme ownership of the financial health of our body? If you are, everything God working and moving, all the transformation, Liz, Liz and James' story that we showed earlier, it's because of you. Because God works and moves through our generosity. But if you're not, what would God have you do in regard to your generosity? Take the next step to ask him and then trust and obey. Trust and obey, not just for yourself, but for us. Trust and obey. <laughs> So we don't end up experiencing 400 years of silence like the Israelites did. Let me pray. Dear Lord, um, I know whenever you preach on this and talk about this, a lot of people just get all tense and angry. Lord, I pray if anyone's experiencing that right now, that, Lord, they look within and ask themselves why instead of looking outside. For those of us who are your followers, Lord, I pray that we choose to just trust and obey you in this way. Whatever you're leading us into, we sang that song earlier. 
You can have it all, Lord. You can have it all, Lord. We sang that song earlier, I Surrender All. And those are easy to sing. And they're great words to inspire us. But Lord, right now, with this, we declare, I will trust and obey. That all to Jesus, whatever you're leading me into, I surrender all. Thank you for loving us. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.